of the many qualities of Jesus' life, healer, prophet, king. It is his words which set him apart from all the rest. Think of this. Jesus, a preacher and a teacher, his words had profoundly influenced Western culture for 2,000 plus years. What Jesus spoke has changed history. In this series of teachings we're calling Final Words, Lasting Promises, we're going to explore the seven last words spoken by Jesus. Six short phrases, one single word. These final words of Jesus spoken as the living word was dying. Hanging upon a Roman cross, Jesus spoke. And the words that Jesus spoke capture his life and his message, who he was then and now. The writers of Jesus' story, the gospel writers, relate to seven final words of Jesus, each of them with a lasting promise. So let's listen to the first of these final words found in Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 32. Two others, criminals, were also led away to be executed with him. When they arrived at the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. The people stood watching, and even the leaders were scoffing. He saved others. Let him save himself if this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was above him. This is the king of the Jews. Let's pray together, please. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight, Lord Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A search of final words spoken by others, mostly the famous, reveals the mystery of a person's final moments. Steve Jobs, creator of the iPhone, looked at his family and said, Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Princess Diana of England spoke to the firefighter trying to save her life and said, My God, what has happened? From centuries ago, Buddha is reported to have said to his followers, Behold, O monks, this is my advice to you. All component things in the world are changeable. They are not lasting. Work hard to gain your own salvation. From the scripture, we hear Jesus say, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. To whom is Jesus speaking? He's speaking to his executioners. Let's set the scene. As best we can determine, Jesus was crucified by four soldiers. John 19 tells us that the clothing of Jesus was divided into four shares, with the soldiers casting lots, small bones, like dice, to see who would get the most valuable of Jesus' only earthly possessions, the clothing he was wearing that day. In particular, Jesus' garment that he wore closest to his skin was described as a seamless garment woven in one piece from top to bottom. And so the soldiers divide his clothing because criminals, Jesus, when he was crucified, was stripped naked. And so the soldiers cast lots. They, they play a game to see who is going to get Jesus' clothing, including the seamless garment woven in one piece from top to bottom. A detail of four soldiers would have been assigned to crucify those to be executed. Uh, four soldiers could handle even the strongest of criminals because prior to being crucified, these criminals would have been beaten terribly, terribly with a whip. It's called scourging. And Jesus, like others, 
to be crucified was scourged, a whip taken, metal balls in the ends of the whip, shards of metal, sharp stones, terribly weakened by the effect of scourging four soldiers could crucify a man. The scripture tells us that there was a centurion there as well, a person, a Roman commander, overseeing the executioner's work. And it's likely that a larger contingent of Roman soldiers were close by because Jesus was crucified at the end of Passover week, that annual celebration that was filled with nationalistic fervor that someday God would once again rescue his people and bring them out from under the rule of others as he had done bringing his people out of Egypt into the promised land. And in Passover, especially in the day of Jesus, there was this nationalistic fervor that longed for God to release them from the Roman rule. Yet, John records how the Jewish leaders swore allegiance to Caesar in order to sway the decision of Pilate to have Jesus crucified. Jesus is handed over to the soldiers to be executed. Soldiers who would suffer the same fate if they failed to obey their orders to crucify him. So for just a moment, let's do our best to explore the mindset of executioners. In a book entitled, Less Than Human, Why We Demean, Enslave, and Exterminate Others, author David Livingston Smith explores the atrocities committed by people against other people. Now, Smith largely looks at the atrocities committed by the Nazis against the Jewish people in World War II, but he goes on to show that this same mindset, the mindset of an executioner, is found even in our world to stay. Looking at the Nazis, Livingstone identifies that the Germans used a word to describe the Jews and many others they systematically tortured and killed. These groups were called Untermeschen. It means subhumans. I see this mindset being played out in the soldiers' actions before Jesus is crucified. All four of the Gospels describe the soldiers taking Jesus, stripping him of his clothing, putting a purple robe on him, making a crown of thorns, and mocking him with words of homage and adoration while they spit upon him and strike him with his hands, with their hands, pounding upon the crown upon his head. I believe the Roman soldiers were doing with Jesus what they had done many other times, not with a person, but with a small figurine. You see, the Roman soldiers played a game called Basileus, or the kingmaker game. A small figurine would be fashioned from sticks, clothed in purple cloth. The king would make his way around a game board carved into the stone. And the figurines were referred to the st by the soldiers. The figurines were called dogs, less than human. And as they made their way around the board, uh, the, the soldier that, that lost could have been beaten by his other soldiers as well. It was a brutal game. And they're playing the same game with Jesus before they crucify him. They make him less than human. In obedience to Pilate's command, the soldiers fashion a sign, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. That sign was fastened to the cross of Jesus. John tells us that the sign was written in three languages, Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. And creating a sign was not, uh, was not at all unusual. In fact, at times the criminal carried it around his neck as he walked to the place of his execution. And throughout all of this, Jesus is made to be less than human in the mindset of his executioners. That same dehumanizing is heard in the shouts of the religious leaders who are mocking Jesus at his crucifixion. He saved others. Let him save himself if this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. Yet Jesus, the most human human that has ever lived, prayed for his executioners. Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. 
And what had the soldiers done to Jesus? They crucified him. For a few moments, let's understand what is known about crucifixion. The Persians began crucifixion as a means of executing criminals and enemies hundreds of years before the Romans. But if such a thing can be said, the Romans perfected crucifixion as a means of squelching any thought of rebellion against the empire. Crucifixion was largely reserved for criminals who were poor. Seldom would a woman be crucified. Even more rare was the crucifixion of a Roman citizen. Crucifixion had one predominant message. Go against Roman power and you will be crucified. Seek in any way to be free of Roman domination. Die a terrible death by crucifixion. Because those who were crucified could linger on a cross for up to four days in excruciating, terrible, terrible pain. The scripture tells us that Jesus died within six hours. A person who was crucified dies of asphyxiation. The pain of pulling up on the spikes driven in the wrist, the agony of pushing up on the spike in the ankles leaves the body slumped forward. From an article written by a medical doctor, the means of execution is described as the arms fatigue, waves of cramps, not them in deep, relentless pain. With these cramps come the inability to push himself upward. Hanging by his arms, air can be drawn into the lungs but cannot be exhaled. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and in the bloodstream, and the cramps partially subside. Spasmodically, he is able to push himself upward to exhale and bring in life-giving oxygen. So Jesus, barely able to breathe, speaks these words. Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. Father, Jesus orients himself in reference to his Father. He doesn't call out to God as a judge. He doesn't call out to God as a strong one. He calls out to his Father. And in himself, in a sense, Jesus orients himself and his executioners with the same reference to God as Father. How easily Jesus could have seen his executioners as less than human. They too, though, have been given life by his Father. And Jesus says of these men who are crucifying him, Father, forgive them. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. For my own walk with Jesus, and as I describe my life and understanding of forgiveness to others, I describe forgiveness as acknowledging the pain and hurt another person has done to me, willfully or in ignorance, without demanding or giving them back the same pain I have experienced. Let me say that again. I believe forgiveness is acknowledging the pain another person, whether willfully or in ignorance, has caused me to experience, and I choose to not repay them with the same pain and hurt that I have experienced. You see, forgiveness frees both the person offended and the person who has caused the pain. It frees you from the prison of resentment and from seeing the other person as less than human. It op opens up the door for the person who has offended you to become free as well. You probably have heard the phrase that hurt people hurt people. I saw a variation of that this week. Simply these words, healed people, heal people. Forgiveness is a part of that healing. You see, forgiveness is a gift you give the other person and yourself. Jesus knows this. Throughout his preaching and teaching, Jesus emphasized how vitally life-giving is forgiveness, both for yourself and for others. The executioners following orders are acting in ignorance, Jesus asserts. They don't know what they're doing. 
In these words, I hear the heart of the only one who has the right to judge any other person's motives. I have learned to leave the judging to Jesus. Left to my own desire to judge others, very quickly I will determine that others and their motives are less than human. Only Jesus can determine that. The final words, Jesus spoke from the cross, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing, is a prayer offered for others, for his executioners. Jesus is enduring the pain they have caused him, but he asked the Father to forgive and not repay them the harm he is experiencing from them. You see, forgiveness is a powerful remedy to our resentment, to to the harm that others have done to us. So I'm going to ask you today, Are you willing to forgive any who have done harm to you? Are you willing to understand your unforgiveness is not causing those who have harmed you to experience any of your pain? Your unforgiveness is not making any difference in the life of another person. Your unforgiveness has shackled you in pain. So are you willing to let yourself go free? Forgiveness is the key to unlocking the handcuffs of your pain and your past. In a few moments, we'll share together in communion. We will taste of the bread and the juice. We'll remember the Father's grace for us. Is there anyone in your life for whom you hold resentment and unforgiveness? Would you be willing to forgive them? Not not denying nor diminishing the pain that others have caused you, but would you be willing to trust Jesus to be the judge of their motives and their means? Would you be willing to see that person who has harmed you as another broken human being in need of the Father's grace. So I I encourage you, take a moment and talk to you, talk to Jesus as we prepare ourselves to receive communion this day. As, As we hear Jesus's first of his final words, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. Are you willing to forgive? To acknowledge the pain and yet to say to the Father, I I don't repay the pain. I, I don't want them to hurt the way that I have hurt. Father, I trust you to be the judge as to their motives and why they did what they did. But Jesus, I want to forgive. Set me free, Jesus, from my resentment. Set me free from the pain that I've experienced as I choose to forgive. Father, as we taste of your grace with bread and juice, Let it come to us as a person forgiven by you. A person who is broken. A person who is in need of a Savior like Jesus. Who could say to the men who were killing him, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. So, Lord Jesus, even if it's just a small move in the direction of forgiveness, I pray that you would honor that in every one of our hearts this day so that we might walk in freedom, so that we might undo the handcuffs which have held our lives for so long. Let us walk in freedom today, Lord Jesus. And we ask these things in your name. Amen.